fun stuff. And um, I have never actually used hot pink in a talk before, but I, I had to because it was too much fun. So um, I thought first I'd tell you a little bit about my job okay, as a professor at Northland College. Um, there are really three aspects to the job of a professor. One is to teach, and that's the biggest part of my job, and, and I enjoy that a lot, and my students get a lot of my time. Um, another one is um, research, okay, and there are actually two aspects of research, one of which is my own original research advancing, doing my part to advance our understanding of the Earth, and then also to keep up with what's going on in the science so that, you know, it informs my teaching, so that, you know, what I teach is current stuff, and that's a really fun part of it because, like I said, the advance of science is fascinating. And then uh, service, service to the college, service to the community, okay? And this is a fun one tonight, so thanks for coming. This is like all three aspects of my job together. I'm teaching, I'm doing service to the community, and I'm showing you the coolest hot stuff in geology, okay? So advances in science come from, front, from advances on four fronts, really, one of which is new technology. We get these new tools, we develop ideas, okay, we could build a machine that does this, and we get new information from it, and it's like we can investigate something we've never been able to investigate, okay? We've got some great old techniques that have been around for a long time, and we're just getting better and better and refining things like radiometric dating, and dating things from the past, okay? Then there's good old field work, right? Hand lens on the rocks. The good old stuff, the 200 years or more of, of field work has really led us to where we are in understanding the Earth. And then, recently we're getting more and more looks into space, okay? And we're understanding more and more about how planets work, how solar systems work, how planets evolve, okay? And that informs us about the Earth, okay? So, we're going to go through those four aspects tonight, okay? Starting with new technology, okay? and. Uh, we got some really cool satellites up there right now, and we're learning a whole lot about the Earth from looking at it from a distance outside of the outside of the um, atmosphere. Okay, and one of the things that has been for a long time sort of um, lots of unknowns about Earth's interior because it is so inaccessible. You know, thousands of miles down there into the interior of the Earth. You know, but. Um, we're getting better. We're getting better tools to figure out what's going on way down below our feet. I mean, the, the surface of Mars is actually more accessible to us than is the rock 100 miles down below us. Okay. So, this, this really cool satellite, it's called GRACE. It's a pair of satellites, actually. GRACE is Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Okay. And there are two satellites. Okay. We'll take two satellites. And there's the Earth, and the satellites are coming around the Earth like this, right? And they are measuring very carefully with a light beam between them how far apart the two satellites are, right? And as they travel, they get slightly further and closer apart, and they can tell what's going on. And it all has to do with gravity. So if this is a really dense rock, okay, the first satellite gets sped up a little bit as it gets closer to that part of the Earth, right? And then they can, so they get a little further apart. And then this one slows down, and this one speeds up, and they get a little closer together. So does this, these things have been going around the Earth for about nine years now, right? You know, figuring out how far apart they are, where is the gravity, okay, where's the gravity high, and where's the gravity low, and it varies a lot, okay? And it has to do with the density of the rock inside the Earth, right? And the density of the rock inside the Earth has a lot to do, is largely controlled by how hot it is, right? So when, when the rock is hot, it's sort of expanded, and the gravity's a little bit lower. Where the, where the rock is colder, it's denser, and the gravity's a little bit higher. So we're getting a view inside the Earth, okay? And we're also getting a view, combined with that with another satellite. Okay, so this is the first one. This is a gravity map of the Earth. Okay, and so up here uh, off the coast of Europe is a gravity high, okay, and there's a place in the Indian Ocean where it's a gravity low, and this is, this doesn't change, this changes over geologic time scale, so millions and hundreds of millions of years that will change, but on a short time scale, it doesn't change, right, because the rock is, is solid, all right, then, but what does change is 
what? Okay. The ocean is pliable. Right? So the ocean has a response to this. So the gravity is high, the water is bulged up. And we didn't know this, but the ocean is bulged up. All right? In uh, some places in the North Atlantic, it is bulged up hundreds of feet. Oh. Okay? And in, in India, and off the coast of India, it is bowed down because there's low gravity. Right? It is bowed down hundreds of feet. Right? And it's such, such a big squash that the ships don't even know it. You know, it's like, okay, they're going down, and they're coming back up. <laughs> you know, because they're also responding to the gravity as well. So, um, fascinating. Okay, so you take another area of the Earth that is really very little understood. This is the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Okay. In January 2005, the USS San Francisco, a nuclear-powered submarine, going full speed ahead, slammed in at 500 feet depth of water, slammed into an uncharted under uh, undersea volcano. Okay, unknown. Full speed ahead. The ship was almost lost. Okay, it struggled to get back to the surface. Uh, one crew member was dead. Most people on the ship were were injured, some very seriously. Okay, because the charts, they didn't have the charts. We don't know that much about the ocean floor. I mean, especially in areas where ships haven't been going. Where ships have been going, and we've been running sonar for a long period of time, we understand. But they were in the South Pacific down here, okay, where the charts aren't very good. All right, so we desperately needed more information about the ocean floor, not just for navigation, but for understanding the Earth, right? So... What you can do with satellite data is like, if you, there's another satellite up there called Jason that's actually measuring the elevation of the ocean. So you combine that with the gravity data and you can subtract out the ocean and figure out, subtract out the water and actually figure out what is the topography on the ocean floor. It's not as exact as a sonar is, but it's, it's global. So we now understand features. This is brand new, this is, this is last fall, okay. Um, we now understand the topography in the ocean floor better than ever before. Okay, and this is from a, research, from a group of researchers at um, Scripps Oceanographic Institution in California. And um, very important because this is detail that we've never known before and all of that has geologic significance. So, you know, that's going to open up a whole new uh, area of understanding of the ocean floor. Okay, then, okay, what changes also with the gravity, what the gravity is also controlled by is water. Okay, so water comes and goes. So you got you understand the gravity control that is contributed by the rock, right? And then gravity, I mean water, you know, if it rains, there's more weight there, so there's a little bit more gravity. Water evaporates and there's a little less water there. Okay. So you can do this correction and figure out what's going on with the hydrologic cycle, right? So here it is. Okay, this is well, this is Southern California, of course, which has been in a pretty severe drought for about a dozen years now. Plus, there's a lot of groundwater pumping for irrigation. And when you pump water out of the ground and put it on the field and it evaporates, it's gone. It's no longer in that system anymore. Okay, so California is losing weight rapidly, okay, because of the evaporation of water. So the gravity is going down and the rock is actually coming up. Okay, so California is coming up because of the loss of water. Okay, we're basically, with this technique, we are measuring the weight of the earth in different places. Okay, so it's not just for water, it's also, oh, this was such big science. It made the cover of science in September, which is really pretty cool. The cover of science, the drought you can't see. <laughs> okay, so what you can also do is you can use that to tell what's going on with sea level. Okay, and this is the sea level curve, and as we know, it's going up, you know, this is like the average line right here. But it doesn't go up steadily, in fact, sometimes sea level goes down a little bit. Okay, because when there's a La Nina year especially, okay, there's lots of water coming out of the ocean and raining onto the continents. Okay, so the continents get heavier for a little while until that water drains back off and the ocean goes up again. <laughs> Okay, so that's what's going on. It's going like this. Okay, and 2010, 2011 was an especially large La Nina year, and so water was lost from the ocean for a short period of time. And it was raining onto the continents, and this is where the continents were getting heavier. Okay, so we're actually measuring the weight of water, measuring the weight of rain <laughs> through a year. Okay, but we're also measuring the weight of ice. 
okay? And that's a really important study right now. What's going on with ice on the planet, okay? And take a look at Greenland right there. Greenland is getting lighter and lighter and lighter because there's the ice is melting off Greenland quite rapidly, okay? So, um, and also the Jason satellite is measuring the height of it, and so the whole thing is coming down as it's sort of the, the ice sheet is collapsing, okay? So very important research there, and you know, from two satellites chasing each other around the globe. <laughs> okay, so new technology is great, but we also are refining old technology and learning a lot from um, getting better and better at using tools we've been using for a long time. And most of what we have known up till now about Earth's interior has come from seismic waves, okay, and that's earthquake waves. And when there's a big earthquake, boom, okay, the Earth vibrates and rings like a bell for days. And we now have enough seismometers around the Earth that when there's a big earthquake, we're measuring it like listening inside of the Earth. You know, and the way the waves travel through it is determined by the density and the rock type and how elastic it is. So you can tell a lot by the way the waves travel through the Earth. Okay, so we now, it's actually called seismic tomography, kind of like a CAT scan. So whenever there's a big earthquake, we're doing a CAT scan of the Earth, all right? <clears throat> and what we see inside the Earth with this advanced technique is that the Earth's mantle, okay, this is, this is the crust, and we live on the crust, mm -hmm. and the crust is basically the outer shell of the Earth, kind of like an eggshell, and then the interior is, you know, the next layer in, like the, like the white of the egg, is the mantle, which is very hot rock. It's not magma, but it's, it's hot rock, and it's kind of moving like a glacier, okay, as a glacier does, you know, hmm. ice sort of sliding by one another. And that's what the mantle does. It moves very slowly, all right, and where the rock in the mantle is hot, it's rising up like this, okay, and where it's cold, it's sinking down like this. This would be a gravity high right there because it's dense rock, all right. So, <laughs> this you might think, why are we interested in the Earth's mantle, right? What we're seeing is that this planet is connected from the core to the top of the atmosphere. Everything is connected on geological time scales. Okay, so what's going on in the mantle is actually really important to what's going on on the surface. Okay, and here's an example. Okay, so this is from seismic tomography. Okay, that blue ball is the Earth's core. Okay, that's the really hot and molten part of the interior of the Earth. And this is the mantle. And these are what we call mantle plumes, where the rock is hot and rising up slowly like a glacier. It takes a million years to come up to the surface. And when it gets to the surface, it has a big impact there. Okay, this right here is the Iceland hotspot plume. So it's hot rock is coming up right underneath Iceland. Okay, so let's go take a look at Iceland now that we're understanding the plume a little bit better. Okay, there's Iceland. It is the plume is right underneath that thing, and that's why there is there are volcanoes on Iceland. Okay. <clears throat> but the, it turns out the geologic record shows us that the the rate at which that hot rock is coming up isn't steady. Right? It'll come. It'll be hotter rock for a time. And it'll be buoyant and then push Iceland up, and there'll be lots of volcanic activity, and then it'll quiet down and it'll sink back down. Okay. So what's happening is the ocean floor, like on million year time scales, will come up and it'll go back down. And they found some land over here um, between Iceland and um, uh, Scandinavia over there where there's a section of the ocean floor that has actually come up above sea level, been eroded by glaciers and rivers and had rivers carved down into it and then it subsided back below the ocean surface again. And there it is, river valleys on the ocean floor. Okay. And what happens when, when this goes on, okay, oh here's the plume coming up, spreading out, lifting things up. We've got some volcanoes there, all right? This was from November as well, so this is recent stuff. <clears throat> okay, it affects ocean circulation patterns, right? And ocean circulation patterns affect climate. So you get this bowl of hot rock moving up from underneath, you know, from the core of the Earth, and it comes up and it lifts the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean floor, and the, the Arctic Ocean is no longer connected well with the Atlantic, and it cools off the planet. <laughs> How about that? Everything is connected from the bottom to the top. Mm. <clears throat> okay, this is my favorite. <laughs> okay. Um, Radiometric dating is taking geologic materials that have 
a radioactive isotope and we know how fast it decays. So we can see, we can tell how old that thing is. And there are lots of different radiometric clocks. Everybody's heard of radiocarbon dating, carbon-14, okay? Um, there are lots of other techniques that we can use. And one that goes, the one that goes back the furthest with the most accuracy is uranium decaying to lead, right? And this mineral right here is zircon. And zircon preserves a really nice record of, of dates, okay? So, and we've been dating zircon crystals for about 100 years, okay? But it was really crude 100 years ago, and we've gotten it better and better and better, okay? And so zircons are tough little grains, and they tell a story of the early Earth. And what a story it is, okay? It turns out that the oldest zircons that we can find are from sandstones. They're teeny, teeny little sand grains from a sandstone, an old sandstone in Western Australia in the Jack Hills, okay? And the sandstone is old, and the grains within it are much older. Okay, and this is research that's been done by John Valley and his students at the University of Wisconsin, um, Madison. Okay, so we are super proud that, that they have done this. And they, it is very painstaking, long, hard hours in the lab to get one date. And they have dated 100,000 grains from the Jack Hills, okay, in the last decade. That's a huge amount of lab time. Okay, and this is what they have found. This right here, this is the oldest grain, okay. Earth is organized as a planet about 4.5 billion years ago, all right? And what you can see within this, this zircon crystal, this is, this is the size of a very small sand grain, okay? Is it's zoned, okay? And it has different ages, and it used to be that, you know, 50 years ago, you date this thing with like an average date for the whole thing, okay? But it's zoned, and it's different ages at different places. And that right there, that core, that is the oldest Earth material we've ever dated, okay? It is 4.4 billion years old on a planet that's 4.5 billion years old, okay? And the title of this article was Closing the Gap, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're closing the gap in our understanding of what happened in the early Earth, you know, when this, the whole solar system sort of organized itself and the first rocks that were preserved, you know, 100 million years. And we're getting a record, we're closing that gap and understanding what was going on in that million, a hundred million years, okay? So there it is, there's, there's all the data. Another important thing that we get out of this is that we can look at all kinds of things in the zircon. So we get an age date, but then we also look at the, the, the oxygen isotopes. They tell a different story, right? And they tell a story of water, right? And it is clear from the oxygen in this thing that within a hundred million years of the Earth forming as a planet, there was liquid water. That crystal had to form with liquid water, okay, present in the system, not actually in contact with it. But, um, so within a hundred million years, there were rocks forming and there were oceans. There was a lot of water, okay. And that's like, that's sort of, sort of mind-blowing because the, the image had been like, it was just a magma ocean for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years, but you know, okay, we're closing the gap. There's a lot like, yet to learn, but what an amazing, amazing story it is of the deep past. And now we got some regular old boots on the ground, hand lens on the rock, the kind of field geology I like to do. Okay, and what we learned from just looking at rocks. And this is a really cool study, a beautiful scientific study done by a real uh, big group of people, uh, Brigham, Young, Brigham Young University, um, scientists from the Czech Republic, and they looked at arches. Okay, um, this is in Arches National Park here in Utah, and um, the formation of arches has always been sort of you know, a curious thing. Why would rock, sandstone is being eroded away, form like this, right? So we know how it happens, and that is that there are, you know, you have a sandstone, and it's got some fractures in it, like this, and the, the water comes in and it erodes out the sandstone, and it makes fins, these are called fins. And then the fins start to get these arches, and then the arches get more, more delicate like this. Okay? So why would it do that? <laughs> That's sort of a mystery. So what they did is they looked around, and they started studying arches and other forms that are similar. All right? 
And um, they do a lot of measurements. This is a beautiful study because they combine field measurements with experiments in the lab, then they took all different kinds of different materials and eroded them and melted them and kind of had them fall apart in certain ways. And then they also did computer modeling. Okay, so they said, okay, well these are the these are the stresses that we would we would expect, and you know if we were to have this system evolve, what are the stresses within the rock? Right. It turns out that what happens when a sandstone is being eroded is that as the weight increases on the rock, it gets stronger. Okay, because the sand grains are being pinched tighter and tighter and tighter. So it is the natural evolution of a, of an, of a rock that's being eroded that the strongest part, that the force gets more and more concentrated and that gets stronger and more able to hold up the rock and the other stuff falls away. So the thing sort of evolves symmetrically to hold itself up. And it's just like a logical progression of forces within the rock. You know? and it's like, that's a beautiful thing, right? To to figure that out. I mean, it's it's really kind of simple, but you know, it took us this long in this kind of science to you know say, okay, this is what's going on with arches, okay? And it's not just with arches; it's all kinds of things. Right? <laughs> take a look at that. I mean, you take a look at that, and you go, why would a rock be bound pedestal rock? Why would it do that, right? But it turns out that this is the natural evolution. Okay, it's actually sort of what we expect to have happen to a boulder that's falling apart. Right. That's pretty cool. Mm. <laughs> okay. Then, we're always interested in the past and what the past can teach us about the present and the future. And good old field geology and combining lots of different techniques, we're learning more about more and more about the Earth's past, not just closing the gap, but you know how, how life has evolved, how the planet has evolved in time. Here's the geologic time scale. There's zero, that's today, right? There's 4.5 billion years ago. Okay, so those zircons are from right there, <laughs> okay? Um, we didn't have many rocks preserved until right about here, right? Just 3,800, 3.8 billion, something like that, okay? Um, and so we're looking at that, and one of the big questions is, what about life? Well, how did life get here? You know, it was a magma ocean at one point. It was like very inhospitable, bombardment by huge meteorites, right? And so what, how did it come to be that here we are? All right, that's a big question. So we go to some of the oldest intact rocks in the world, not just individual sand grains, but there's the rock, you know, that is part of the past, all right? And Northwest Greenland has some of the oldest rocks in the world. Um, just under four billion years old, all right? And these are, interestingly, these are iron formations, okay, not too unlike what we have in the Lake Superior region. And within there, there are little pieces of carbon, okay? And you look at the carbon and there are just the right, there aren't fossils in these things, but there are just the right chemical signatures in the carbon that it's very hard to explain any other way other than life, okay? In rocks that are nearly four billion years old. Right, and then you go to 3.8 billion, you got more of that, and more of that, and more of that, okay? And it's like, it wasn't, certainly wasn't a robust ecosystem way back then. But it looks like as soon as conditions were habitable, there was life here, okay? So the thinking is now that maybe life is actually, life is, will happen. You know, it's like given the right set of circumstances, it's kind of like crystals happen. You know, given the right set of circumstances, crystals happen. Given the right set of circumstances, life happens. Okay? And it didn't happen a lot, you know, four billion years ago, but it got going. Okay? It had a little start. Are these okay. probably bacteria? Um, yes. Probably. Yes. Not not bacteria. Not bacteria. Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and they're not preserved. It's not like you can see the bacteria. Okay? We don't get that until, you know, 2.7 billion years ago, where it's like, you can recognize what the thing was. Okay. Then about 2.4 billion years ago, okay, it looks like life was getting a hold enough, it was still very inhospitable conditions, but 2.4 billion years ago, there was a jump in the oxygen level, and it probably had to do with photosynthesis, and this has become known as the great oxygenation event. And oxygen is very reactive, so as soon as the planet's got free oxygen in it, there are all kinds of things can different things can start to happen. 
And when we look into space, we're looking for signs of life. We're really looking for the presence of water and the presence of free oxygen. Because those two things are thought to be prerequisites for life as we know it. I mean, other things are possible, but um, there it is. Okay. So, this is, this is what we got. This is the first multicellular creature that lived on Earth. And it probably lived in response to increasing oxygen in the atmosphere and in the water. Okay. Yes. It was a slow start. It was a very slow start. Okay. But it's becoming clear that life is an integral part of the plant. Okay. So the biosphere, the lithos, the biosphere, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, that's the rock, they all are interacting. And they're, they, it's, like, it's like a great big biological, geological dance, right? So the, the earth doesn't change, life doesn't change. Life doesn't change, earth doesn't change. And it's going back and forth. Okay, so this was, this takes us to about um, 390 million years ago, okay, when life came onto land for the first time in a big way, okay, Mississippi, right, and um, roots, plant roots, it looks like plant roots really changed the world, okay, and this is just some basic geologic studies, like, okay, what was going on with, with sediments and soils moving around on Earth's surface before this and then after this, so the, the development of roots and forests really had a big change, because Sediments weren't just flushing all over the place anymore like they were before, right? Rivers, like rivers before this, rivers probably just covered the whole earth and water was going everywhere and it was just sand, right? But then plants was like, no, the river's going to be here, okay? And so rivers were channelized and forests grew and it really started to affect the way rocks were deposited. So rocks, sedimentary rocks are different now than they were before there were tree roots, okay? Here's a great one. We love this one. Okay, <laughs> this guy, this ant right here. <coughs> this study, this is a beautiful study. Another one, just sort of simple, you know, field geology. Um, this was a professor at uh, Arizona State University. For the last 25 years, he has gone out with his students and dug up the sand that ants are moving around, right? Every year they go out and they dig up some sand <laughs> from the ants or moving out, okay? And there are a lot of ants on planet Earth. <laughs> the ants move a lot of sand grains. And you know what they do? Every time they pick up the sand grain, they move around and they spit on it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and you know what the ant spit does? It starts to corrode the mineral. Okay? So it turns out that ants because they're moving around in the soils, okay, speed up the weathering of minerals 30 to 50 times more than in the absence of ants. Okay, so ants are a major weathering force. So you start doing the calculations of how many trillions of ants there are on the earth, and you start multiplying that by 60 million years, right? And that's a whole lot of ant spit. Okay. <laughs> and that's had a whole lot of influence on a lot of minerals. Okay. So this mineral right here, a very common mineral, right, is actually being weathered and the ants are contributing or changing it from this mineral into this mineral, right? And this carbonate mineral right here, what happens is it actually reacts. The the mineral is actually reacting with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, so as the ants are doing this and the minerals are changing, carbon dioxide is coming out of the atmosphere and being added to the sand. Okay, and you start doing these calculations of how fast this is happening, and you know what? You get a global cooling event, taking, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it into soils by ants. Okay, talk about an interconnection between the atmosphere and the biosphere. Okay, so the last 30 million years or so, the carbon dioxide has been falling. It's a different story today, okay, but the carbon dioxide has generally been falling and it's been getting cooler and there's a lot of ice on the planet, okay, in comparison to the deep past, right? And that could be attributed to the uh, ants. What a connection. So oh, ants are <laughs> some of the superheroes. Yeah, superheroes. <laughs> some of Emily's superheroes. Oh, <laughs> Emily has written about the superheroes of the, of the world. And the ants are certainly in there. Okay. Okay. 
Now we go to th this scientist. Okay, here's another superhero. She's also <laughs> holding up an ice core. Okay, so we're trying to understand the past climates. Okay, what has happened with climate on Earth, and how does that inform us about what's going on right now and what might happen in the future? Okay, really important studies, and the best climate record we have comes from ice. Because as ice is crystallizing, and snow is falling and turning into a glacier, it actually traps air bubbles, and it traps a lot of other information in the ice that, about what was going on with climate. Okay? And we're getting better and better at getting the ice and getting the information out of the ice. Okay? In Antarctica, in the middle of Antarctica, the record is we're almost up to a million years. Okay? It's, it's like 900,000 years, 850, 900,000 years of ice record in climate change. Okay, so here's ice. Here it is near the top, and it's not the layers aren't very visible. But then you go down further, and you got all these layers, and each one of those is a is a winter. Okay, snow accumulates, snow accumulates, so you can count them. Count them all. It's the job of the graduate student. One, two. Three. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the bottom, there's a lot of sediment in there. But we're getting better at t getting the record out. And it's no surprise that when CO2 goes down, temperature goes down, CO2 comes up, temperature goes up. Carbon dioxide is one of many things that controls climate, but it's one of the major drivers. Okay, there's no doubt that CO2 in the atmosphere, when CO2 is high, it's warm. Okay, the climate record is getting better though. Okay, so because this is this is a little bit crude, you know, it's like you can tell that they they correspond, but how closely do they correspond? Okay, it's now clear that the temperature has a little bit of a lag time behind the CO2, okay? And it makes perfect sense because that's the mechanism, okay? So CO2 goes into the atmosphere, all right? And it stays there for a while and it stays there for a long time, all right? And the climate gradually warms up, okay? So the carbon dioxide that's coming out of our, out of our power plants and tailpipes right now is contributing to warming for a long period of time. And there it is, okay? So CO2 goes up and then temperature goes up. So, very important studies. What are um, kilo years? Thousand years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We also get climate information out of rocks. Okay, and it's a little tougher to get climate information out of rocks, but we can do it. And um, soils are really important, like the ants. Okay, so that carbon, the carbon dioxide that's coming out, we get a record of that in the ant hill. Okay. Interest. So here we are. We are looking, we're looking back in time and we're trying to find the times when a corollary to what's going on right now. Okay, because carbon dioxide, carbon is coming out of the earth by burning the fossil fuels, coming out of the earth and going into the atmosphere very rapidly on a geologic time scale, very rapid. Okay, so we're looking back in time and saying, okay, what has, has this happened before and what was the consequence? Okay, so we're looking for those times. And we go back 56 million years, okay, to a time when there was a big change. Okay, and we've known there was a big change, but it's hard to find it, right? It turns out that it, the best record, one of the best records on land, is in Wyoming, not far from Yellowstone National Park, near Cody, Wyoming. This is in the McCullough Hills. There are a lot of wild horses in the McCullough Hills, okay? And it just so happens that that's where I've been taking my geology field camp. I teach geology field camp out, out there every other year. And I've been going there for a long time, hiking over these rocks. I knew what age they were, and I knew of this event, but I didn't know where it was or anything. So someplace in these layers is preserved a record of a time when carbon changed really rapidly. Okay? You don't know it when you hike across it. It's like, you know, there's just another layer in there. Okay? But if you do the detailed analysis, this is, this is brand new science. Okay? This was released, I, I read this last week, as a matter of fact. Okay? Um, you don't need to understand the details of this, but this is carbon, okay? So it comes up here like this, boom, big spike. Actually, two big spikes like that, and then it slowly recovered, right? And this is a good enough record that now we're st this study is about how fast did it happen, and that's really the important question here, right? And this is the fastest that we can find in the geologic record, and what's happening today is faster, okay? This is the fastest carbon release from rock into the atmosphere that we can find. Okay? So what's going on right now is pretty much unprecedented. So of course the next question is, what is in the layers above that? What happened on Earth after that big release of carbon? It was a very sudden release. Okay? And what's happening now is even more sudden. 
and we know that the concept, we know what's going on. Okay, this was released, uh, this was also last week. You probably read this, that 2014 was the warmest year on record that we've been keeping track with <coughs> thermometers. Okay, so this is a clear trend, but it is, you know, I mean, when you look at climate change, it's actually a relatively short record. Okay, the trend is very clear, but it's a pretty short record, and one year doesn't really mean anything, but it is, it, the trend does continue. Okay, last thing here. Looking out into space, <laughs> what do we learn about Earth when we look out into space? Okay, because we got important lessons from out there, too. This is really cool. Okay, this is uh, Rosetta, okay, and this is Philae. <laughs> and they, in November, they, Philae, landed on comet P46, I think it was, I forget the name of the comet, okay? And, and Rosetta kept circling and taking pictures, <laughs> okay? So, uh, Philae oh came, comes crashing down here onto the comet, all right? It took five or ten years to get to the comet, you know, and then it took a long time to get ready to, to land on it, and a comet doesn't have a lot of gravity. This is about a mile across here. Okay, so it doesn't have a lot of gravity. And Philae comes in and hit and bounced. Okay, this is a little bit unexpected. All right, and boing, two hours later, <laughs> boing, <laughs> comes down with a thud. Okay, on its side at the bottom of a cliff. All right, and solar panels weren't pointed at the sun. So this is not what was planned. Okay, nevertheless, from its side, it was able to get a little bit of soil there, okay, and do an analysis, and it had 60 hours of battery life, and in that 60 hours was, was able to tell us that the water on a comet is not the same as the water on Earth, okay, very interesting, okay, so, hmm, well, we don't actually know where the water on Earth came from, so now we have to answer that question, okay, and, um, yeah, it's, it's getting closer to the sun. Okay, so its solar panels will soon start to collect enough energy that it can maybe start to science again. Okay, today's issue of science has seven papers, okay? Um, I didn't have time to read them all for this, but seven papers from the science that came out of this. And it, comets are, all we know so far is that comets are way more complicated than we expected. Is that a surprise? Not really. Okay, so. Uh, very interesting primordial material from the early solar system that didn't get, that didn't accrete, but they're really different than, than uh, asteroids. So a different part of the solar system, and we have a lot to learn from it. Okay, there's Philae sitting on its side. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. This is an awesome machine right here. This is the most advanced scientific robot ever created. It is the Curiosity rover. It's been on the surface of Mars for about a year and a half, sending back amazing data. There is just some fantastic instruments on that machine. Okay, and it's working marvelously, too. Okay, so uh, Curiosity, after a spectacular landing, um, has been climbing around doing geology, <laughs> doing field geology, okay? Scratching at the soil, analyzing rocks, sending back pictures, <coughs> taking close-up pictures, it's got a hand lens on, okay? And what we're learning is um, about the history of planet Mars, right? Which is important because, you know, it's a, we're trying to understand how planets evolve. And the big question, of course, is was there life there? And has life played a role in the history of Mars as it has on Earth? Okay, it is very clear that water has played a very important role on that planet. Okay, especially early, early in its history. There is, there is water, there's definitely water there now, but it's frozen groundwater. Okay, so it's not having much influence on the planet now. But there clearly was running water, there was standing surface water. Okay, and so one of the things that Curiosity is trying to figure out is, was there the conditions for life? And the, it's pointing to yes. Okay. Um, that is a question that really captures the imagination of the public, and it's an important thing that we're doing that. But it's, it's also important that we come to understand the way planets evolve. And there has been some great science that has come out of this, just in terms of, I mean, this is, this is a newly released geologic map of Mars. <laughs> okay. that's, I think that's an amazing achievement to be able to make a pretty detailed map of a different planet. 
Okay, so that's an achievement of science right there. Okay. A good friend of mine is a minister, and she has dedicated her life to helping people who are in need. And she asked me, why, when we have so many problems on earth, why would we spend any money trying to figure out a different world when we have so many problems right here on this planet? And we're sending things up there for a billion dollars, right, to learn what, right? And I don't disagree with that. That is a difficult question to answer, okay? So I will try to answer her question, okay? First of all, we are curious people, right? And we need to, we need to find the answers, right? Um, another thing is that this is fantastic science that affects kids, too, right? And we want to have kids get curious about science, you know? And what, what kids love the idea of, of other planets, you know? So it draws kids in. Who knows what kind of scientists they're going to turn into. Science is also, um, we don't know where it's going to go. We don't know what we're going to find, what the implications of what we are going to find, right? Another thing is that the perspective that it gives us, okay? This is the Earthrise photograph, okay? And Earthrise was taken on Christmas Eve, 1968. And it was a really historic moment because the Apollo 8 spacecraft was going to the moon, right, and orbiting the moon. They didn't land, okay? And they came around the moon. They had gone out of contact with with Houston, and they came around the moon, and suddenly, for the first time, the spacecraft windows were pointed at the Earth. And this is the first time humans had seen the Earth from a distance. And their cameras were clicking and clicking and clicking, and then as soon as those photos were available, you know, they went worldwide. And this was 1968 when we were, you know, the civil rights movement was going on, and we were first starting to understand the environmental impacts. And this photograph was like emblazoned in the consciences of our society as we're, as we're changing as a society. Okay, it is a really important photograph. Or it's sort of a symbol of the change that was taking place there. Okay, today we are, we have, you know, this is 50 years later and, you know, there are almost twice as many people on the planet and you know, we're looking at climate change taking place and how, what, where is this going, right? And some people are thinking, well, maybe we move to Mars, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and what Mar I think that this may be the Earthrise photograph of this generation, okay? Because you take a look at the surface of Mars, and it's very clear. I mean, maybe there was a little microbe here or there, but that planet has never had life, on, robust life on it. That's very clear. Okay, there has not been an ecosystem there like the way there is on Earth. And there aren't the ingredients there for life. Okay? That is not a habitable planet right now. Okay? We're not going to go there. We're not going to live there. Okay? We're not even sure we can get somebody there and live long enough to get them back. Okay? We're not going to live there. All right? So this is a really important photograph because we're not going to live there. Okay? This is our home. Right here. This is Earth. Okay. This was taken by Apollo 17, the last Apollo mission to come back, and the only Apollo mission to carry a geologist, by the way. Okay, coming back to Earth, and this is the photograph that they took on the way back. Okay. So I think that this is the message that we get from space exploration and from from the advance of science. Is one is that this planet is totally interconnected from the core to the top of the atmosphere. And life is an integral part of the planet, and always has been. Okay, it's locked in this great biological, geological dance, and we're part of that. We don't know where it's going. We do know that we're having a big influence. Okay. We also know that the more we look into space, the more special this planet is. Okay, this is a really special place. Okay. And I think that what we learn from this is that the more we see in the Earth, the more special it is. And the more you understand something, the more you see in it. And the more you see in it, the more beautiful it is. Okay? And the more you love something, the more you're willing to work to protect it. So I really think that that photograph right there, this is my answer to my friend Holly, is that that is the Earthrise photograph of this generation, to know that this is our home. All right.
consequences of that technique, all right? And so the technology to get it out advances. Our understanding of the technique of the consequences are slow, and then the regulations on that are even slower, mm -hmm. okay? So basically, companies have been doing what they want, and regulations are in the process of trying to figure out what to do, you know, with, a, with this lag time. And we're in this sort of dangerous period right now, and we don't understand what's going on, but we're doing it on a really large scale, and the regulations are just starting to, you know, we're just starting to get some kind of regulations on it. Um, my thought, well, we've got an oil geologist here. I think we should hear from Fred. But, um, yeah, go ahead. If you frack deep enough in the earth, there's no direct consequence to your water or, or you know, near the surface of the earth. If, if the geologic conditions are right, to contain all this stuff, but a lot of what they're fracking is shallower and shallower, and that's what Tom said is the re regulations lag. Uh, for a fracking, they use <coughs> hundreds of big compressor trucks, put chemicals in under huge pressure. They just line these trucks up down the road, and then they just horsepower. They just drive fluids into the rock and <coughs> and sand from Wisconsin. They mine sand in Wisconsin. Uh, to, to go with the fluid, and then when the fluid goes into the rock, it fractures the rock, the sand stays there and keeps the fracture open so the fluids can flow back out the oil or gas. So uh, if it's done deep enough, it's certainly safe and the conditions are right. If it's shallow, it may or may not be safe, and the regulations haven't kept up. And, um, and also there's some evidence in uh, uh, New York and uh, Pennsylvania shows that if you inject fluids into the earth and there are faults, you can lubricate those faults and cause some earthquakes. And, and they know when this happens because ha they frack and they get an earthquake and, and people are monitoring this all the time. Uh, scientists are. So uh, it's, it's not like, so, so we know when that happens and we know when it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen a lot, but where it's happening we know it and, and we, we can't do it. So there's just a little background on right. fracking. Yeah, true? Also, your low oil prices are directly <laughs> related to fracking. Yeah. Yeah. But is it also true that a lot of these operations lead to the release of methane, which is many times worse than the greenhouse gas, which offsets the benefit of lower CO2 emissions? The, meth the methane doesn't directly get released into the atmosphere. It gets released into the oil well bore, and it gets produced. and Gets sent to your house. Um, I mean, that's what they're doing this this for. But, but if the well isn't sealed properly. Well, yeah. Well, um, fr fracking has nothing to do with good and bad wells. There's good and bad oil wells, and, and good and bad practices for for making those wells. And um, well, that's also something that that's regulated. So, yes, um, oil wells can leak. Uh, if they're done right, they won't leak much or anything. Um, the, uh, the, the, there, there is regulations in place on how this dish should be engineered and how it should be done. And um, some operators don't follow. Operators meaning the drillers don't follow these, the, the rules and these practices. That's why we you know, need inspectors and uh, government agencies. Um, there's, there's some leakage. There's some leakage from pipelines. There's leakage from your house. I mean, uh, there's leakage all over the system. Does so, we have any, any idea how much oil there actually is in the world? I mean, I'm in the 70 <laughs> top. We really root the backs. We're going down, and now it's like we find it everywhere in my backyard. I mean, do we have any? I mean, well, I, 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 <coughs> I can't answer the question on the the total amount. But what's happened in the oil industry, I've worked in the oil industry, 
when I started, it was all what's called conventional oil and gas. It was in sandstones or limestones. Big pores in the rock came flowing out. We didn't frack it much back then, although we did frack sometimes back then. Um, we ran out of, out of this easy to get resource, and now we've gone to another uh, resource that's, that's harder to get to, which is uh, very uh, uh, tight sandstones that don't flow anything out of them, and limestones, to, and, and the source rocks. So oil and gas are formed in these source rocks, these shales in the earth, and some of the oil and gas is trapped in there, and that's what we're doing. We are fracturing the source rocks and getting oil and gas out of the source rocks. That was, was left behind when you know, uh, that, that supplied the, the conventional stuff. So what we've done is taken a it's like a pyramid. The the top part of the apex of the pyramid, we've taken out all the easy to get stuff. Now we're down into the next layer. It's really hard to get. Next, this, this is very expensive. This is you know, part of your hundred dollar barrel oil is because this stuff's expensive. These guys are, are they they need seventy dollars a barrel oil to make this fracking business work. You know, right. at 50, they're going to stop doing it. You know, uh, but it goes back to 70, and yeah. they'll start doing it again. But the, the the resource layer we're into now, to answer your question, is much bigger than the apex of this pyramid, which was a small. But we used up the apex, and now we're into, and how big is is the resource in this layer we're in now? It's advancement of technology. I don't I don't know, uh, but it does rely on on fracking. And it is very expensive. Well, let me add one thing, and um, that is that it, with a lot of resources, um, it's it's almost impossible to say how much there is because it really has to do with the price and the demand. Because as the as the demand goes up and the price goes up, more and more resources become available. You can go further offshore and still make money deeper, and the amount of carbon on this planet that could potentially be burned is vast. Okay, we're really just, you know, we're just getting to this advanced technology now. Who knows what's going to be the technology and where we will find it in the future. I mean, it's a big complicated planet. So, the issues really are, the issue isn't really so much supply. The issue really is how much are we willing to spend to, to burn oil? How much are we willing to pay for a barrel of oil? And what's going to happen to that carbon once it's in the atmosphere and what's going to be the impact of it. Okay, So those those two questions are much bigger questions than how much is in the earth, you know, because it's big. So what happens is like, you know, you get less and less and less and less, you know, I mean, harder and harder and harder to get stuff, but there's always more, you know. <laughs> it's the same, it's the same with, with copper, it's the same with, with iron, it's, you know, all, a lot of mineral resources are that way. It's like, you know, Geologists can almost always find some more. Thank you. To yeah. Change the subject quick. Yeah. The fact that there's evidence that there was water on Earth in the first hundred million yes. years, and the fact that the water in the recently visited comet is different yeah. than the water on Earth, does that cast doubts to the theory that the water on Earth came from comets? Yes, it does. Uh -huh. um, uh, the, what I read sometime between November and now was that um, the thought is that, it, that they came in on asteroids, okay, and the asteroids made up the bulk of the material that, that actually went to form the Earth. So it was thought that the meteorites, came, you know, the, the asteroids came in and created the Earth, and then comets added the volatiles, the water, and the carbon dioxide and stuff, okay. But it's looking like, based on one comet, <laughs> that um, the water probably came in with the asteroids as well. But asteroids are dry, so it doesn't, you know, they're mostly dry, so it doesn't, you know, it's not a satisfactory explanation. So, the com landing on a comet has raised more questions than it has given answers. Hmm. <laughs> Which is the way science works. That's right, it's great, too. It's like, yeah, we don't understand it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now we have some more to learn. <laughs> That's cute. Well, no, I'm going to ask for it. So, how is the water from the, the comet different from the water on Earth? Um, Okay, uh, water is H2O, right. and um, there are, for hydrogen and for oxygen, there are different isotopes. Okay, so there's hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, hydrogen 3, okay, and there's oxygen 16 is a common one, 16, 17, 18. So you look at the ratios of the oxygen and the hydrogen, the 
rate, isotopic ratios of the hydrogen and the oxygen in the water, and it doesn't change through time. And it's a really good signature of its history, okay, and where it came from. So the fact that a comet is a different isotope ratio than the bulk water on Earth is, is a significant thing. But we don't understand how comets operate, because if you go to different places on Earth, you get different isotope ratios in the water as well. So, you know, we don't know about a comet. It's like, well, it could be different in different places on the comet. You know, so, yeah, that's how you tell, right. But it's, what's interesting about the water isotope thing is that we are mostly water, and if you do an isotopic analysis of a person, and you can tell where, the, where their water has come from, right? So if you live in this area long enough, you know, you are, your body is the isotopic ratios of the water that you've been drinking, or the beer or the wine from California. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all a little bit Midwestern, a little bit Californian. <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question from the the slide with the ants coming yeah. up and doing right. their work. As an ant, I watched my four-year-old, three-year-old, and two-year-old boys, <laughs> nephews, earth moving, you know, yes. picking up stones. Right. And then I watch my brother with his bulldozer, earth moving. Yes. And then I watch all these construction people everywhere where I have mm -hmm. resided, moving massive amounts of earth for building projects. Yes. And how is this multi-million or billions of people, yes. like ants, who are constantly earth moving? Yeah. How are we affecting? Yeah. Agriculture all these is a really big one. Mm -hmm. Plowing the fields because how we do that on such a huge scale. Yeah. Affecting all of this shift in the... Uh, yeah, big. Very big. Wow. Okay. Um, it's clear that humans are now a geological force. I mean, we have as much influence on what's going on on the planet by the way we're living as you know, volcanoes and all the other geological processes together. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just what you said, the bulldozers and the tractors moving things around. Okay, it releases carbon dioxide to the atmosphere as soils are aerated and there's decomposition in the soils. And then the big one is erosion. Okay, and the rate of erosion today off of farm fields especially, but you know, construction sites as well, is twice what it is background natural processes. Okay, so the Mississippi River is carrying way more sediment. All of the big rivers are carrying way more sediment, and lots more dissolved ions off the of farm field as well, nitrogen and phosphorus. You know, so um, you're right. right? The bulldozers and the tractors definitely have an effect. And the little boys with kind of And the little boys. They're well, you know. <laughs> they're going to be big boys. They're going to grow up to four. That's good, though. They're, they, the little boys and the little girls that are playing in the sand, they're going to grow up to yes. respect and love the earth. And that's important what they're doing. <laughs> no more questions? Thank you so much, Tom, for all that great information.